Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today we're continuing with John Morris Pendleton's presentation where he goes over why he thinks the Earth is only 6,000 years old. So far, it's because he thinks it's possible that people will continue to reproduce beyond the carrying capacity of the universe, and then he read half a sentence from a study that, in isolation, kinda sorta looks like it might support his point if you look at it sideways. Let's see where he goes from here! On the other extreme, we have a process for dating rocks. This is called uh, potassium argon. Well, it's one of many, but yes, we have many radiometric dating methods. In 1801, a volcano in Hawaii made it had an eruption, and the lava flowed, and touched the water, stayed in the, there, solid there. Well, that's a quotable moment. Let's make a poster out of that. Sorry it's so grainy, but, you know, I can only work with what I have. They took those samples 167 years later to see how long it had been since the volcano erupted. Is that why they took those samples? Is it? Because it seems to me that we would have other methods of determining that more reliably. You are also bringing this up in a segment that you started by talking about potassium argon dating, which is useless at ages below 100,000 years. So why would we take samples from an eruption that is known to be less than 200 years old and date them with a method that is useless under 100,000 years? That doesn't quite add up, does it? Is this another case like the snails from part one, where you look at just one part of a paper that is actually investigating a known issue with the dating method, so that you know we can avoid falling into the trap of using that method incorrectly and coming up with the wrong answer? We already know, 167 years. But with potassium argon, we got dates between 100 million years to 3 billion years ago that it erupted. I'd like to see your source for that, because those numbers are well outside the range that I've heard from other creationists making the same argument. Usually this argument stems from this paper, called Radiogenic Helium and Argon in Ultramophic Inclusions from Hawaii, which, if you read the paper title carefully, you might be able to see why this argument fails. I'll give you a hint. In geology, an inclusion is any material that is trapped inside a mineral during its formation. What does that mean for a lava flow? It means there are bits of rock crystals in the lava flow that did not melt in the lava, meaning that they are older than the flow itself. Dating these inclusions does not give us a date for the eruption. It gives us the date of the formation of the inclusion. Now, for this particular study, the age range that they found using potassium argon dating for the inclusions went from 92 million years on the low end to 2.48 billion years on the high end. And actually, if we just limit it to the specific 1801 eruption, only two inclusions were dated with potassium argon, and they gave an age of 1 billion years for one and 2.48 for the other. And so, as I mentioned, for things that we do know, we find that that also is unreliable. Even if I ignore the fact that they were dating inclusions rather than the flow itself, using potassium argon dating on a lava flow that is under 100,000 years old would have yielded an age of zero because we can't get younger than 100,000 years with potassium argon. And as it turns out, that same study did, in fact, measure the radiogenic argon within the lava flow itself, and they found none, indicating an age of zero. It's almost like radiometric dating works, but has to be used correctly in order to work correctly. If I buy a bicycle and then get mad that I can't cross the ocean with it, is it the bike's fault or my fault for buying the wrong kind of vehicle? Creationists have their bike, and they are throwing fits because it won't get them across the ocean, blaming everything except their choice of vehicle. Also in the Grand Canyon, we have lava that has flown over the edge of the canyon over the rocks, as well as a layer down below that's called the Cardenas, which is volcanic rock. Those two were tested. Obviously, the one that's flowed over the side of the canyon is the much younger lava flow. The one that's way down in one of the rock layers, the Cardenas layer, is obviously much older. So is that an admission that the laws of stratigraphy are accurate? Usually creationists don't much care for Steno's laws. But in almost all of the testing that was done, the older one tested out millions of years younger than the younger one. Not almost all of the testing. The non-creationist affiliated testing gives the younger flow an age of about 1.12 million years, and the older flow gets an age of about 1 billion years. 
But the creationist testing, carried out by Steve Austin, the stone-cold geologist, came back with an age for the older flow being slightly younger than the younger flow. Now how did that happen? Well, Austin used samples from four different lava flows and one phenocryst, which is a large crystal inclusion, which is a big no-no if you want to date one single flow. The way he went about his testing is actually the same method that is sometimes used to figure out the age of the common source for some samples. So when he dated the samples using the isochron diagram, he actually did it accurately for the common source for all the flows, the lithospheric mantle underneath the Grand Canyon. So what Austin did was figure out that the source of all the lava flows for the Grand Canyon is older than the Grand Canyon. That's why his dating came back with a younger age for the older flow. All of the flows will be younger than their source. And the younger one tested out millions of years older than the older one. Because he wasn't testing the age of the flow itself, but of the flow's source. Since the younger flow had the same source as the older flow, and he tested the source's age with the younger flow, it makes sense that he came back with an older age from the younger flows. Maybe an analogy would help, this is getting a little bit mixed up in my head at least. A potter makes five pots. Now let's imagine that they can be dated exactly, and you can figure out years after the death of the potter exactly which year he made each pot. Now imagine that we could figure out the year the potter was born by examining all five of the pots, and we find that the potter was born before he made any of the pots. Is this fact surprising? It shouldn't be. And yeah, I can already hear the creationists attacking me because of my use of imagination for an analogy. So let me just explicitly point out that this potter analogy is a rhetorical device to help people wrap their heads around what I'm talking about, including myself. The source is the potter, the lava flows are the pots, and without imagination we actually can date the source from an examination of the flows. And so, consistently we've seen that it's not reliable. The Earth is young. Hold up there, Sparky. Firstly, you have done nothing to demonstrate that radiometric dating is actually unreliable. In fact, Austin's results rather confirm that it works as expected. But even if you had completely dismantled everything we know about radiometric dating, that would not actually demonstrate that the Earth is young, just that we haven't dated it accurately yet. There are a lot of ways that we know the Earth is old that have nothing to do with radiometric dating. Geologists figured out that the Earth was older than 6,000 years, hundreds of years before radiometric radioactivity was even a hypothetical concept. Some say, well, you need a long period of time to make fossils. I mean, technically speaking, a fossil is literally just any evidence of an organism that is older than 10,000 years old. There is no particular form that anything has to have in order to be considered a fossil. I mean, hell, we have actual real bone fragments that are not permineralized from dinosaurs. They're still fossils. So what I think you're going for here is that the permineralization process takes a long time rather than fossilization. Not all fossils are permineralized and not all permineralized artifacts are fossils. Well, there's lots of fossils out there. Here's one of my favorite ones. This is a cowboy boot. This was found in West Texas. And uh, at the right hand image here, we see that the poor cowboy broke his leg and his leg and foot stayed inside the boot. Now they did a scan of the toe section, all five toe bones are in there. Who did a scan? Carl Baugh, the guy known for faking evidence so badly that even other creationists don't want to be associated with him? Because he's the guy that put the boot up in his museum. There are no records of this boot ever having been examined by anyone, just claims that it has been. There is no evidence to suggest that the bone in the boot is permineralized. The boot itself is not permineralized. It's all fossilized. This was found in the 1980s. It was claimed to have been found in the 1980s, but yeah, like I said, it has never been examined by anyone. It has just been claimed to have been fossilized. And you said it was completely fossilized? Carl Baugh said that the bone is fossilized, but the boot is not, claiming that this is evidence that the different materials fossilize at different rates, which is actually true, but he got it backward. The softer leather of the boot would have been permineralized much faster than the bone. This water wheel uh, of wood had water flowing over it. In a matter of 60 years, the wood became petrified wood. It became rock. 60 years, petrified wood. Not millions of years. Did it become solid rock? Or was there just a buildup of minerals caused by water flowing over it? 
Given that Creation Ministries International says that it became entombed by solid rock, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss your claim that the wood itself has completely gone through the permineralization process. If there were evidence to support that, CMI would have jumped on it. Mineral buildup where there is water is a known phenomenon and can happen quickly. Now, I'm skipping the rest of his examples of young fossilized item. They all have generally the same rebuttal. Either it's a Karl Ba likely fake, or it's something that is already known to happen quickly, so it doesn't really present an issue. Like I said, not all fossils are permineralized, and not all permineralized artifacts are fossils. These beautiful gems are called opals. And according to evolutionary theory, it takes millions of years to make opals. Now, there's opal mines in a place in Australia, and a opal dealer went and just took some of the powder from these mining areas, placed it in different jars with different acids and chemicals. He is making opals in a matter of months. Yes, opals can be artificially manufactured fairly quickly, if you give them perfect conditions in which to form. Unfortunately for the creationist argument, perfect lab conditions aren't really reflective of the environment where the opals would have formed naturally. And again, even if you're right, that just means that opals form faster than we thought. It says nothing to the age of the Earth. To the best of my knowledge, no scientist has ever proposed an age for the Earth based on opal dating. Young things exist and sometimes form quickly is not an argument against an old earth. Takes millions of years to make opals? Afraid not. Natural processes are able to do it in a matter of months. Natural processes? Excuse me? Let's go back again and see how you said these were made. A opal dealer went and just took some of the powder from these mining areas, placed it in different jars with different acids and chemicals, he is making opals in a matter of months. So if I am to take what you're saying at face value, removing powder from a mine and mixing it in a jar with some chemicals and acids, which I'm sure if I looked into it is a gross oversimplification of what the process actually is, but that's a natural process? How does that even remotely qualify as natural? I took this picture near Monterey, Mexico, and what this billboard says in English is publicity for the Garcia Caverns in Monterey, Mexico. Of course they are <laughs> brainwashing us. What was that? Why are you giving your pen a whistly blowjob? And how is the phrase publicity for the Garcia Caverns in Monterey, Mexico, a statement that is supposed to brainwash anyone? I mean, it's hard to make out, but I'm pretty sure I see Milones de Años at the top of that billboard, sorry about the pronunciation, that's Spanish for millions of years, but you seem to have forgotten to translate that part, so I did it for you. I'm helping you point out where they are <laughs> brainwashing us. You're welcome. What it says is 60 million years of nature, a drop at a time. Okay, I guess you did translate that part, but why did you even bother with the first part and present that as if that were the statement that is supposed to be <laughs> brainwashing us? It doesn't make much sense. But then, what in this presentation has made sense? Now, what can we do to protect ourselves? Use condoms. Now, that was use condoms, not used condoms. Those are two very different things. Well, it's always a good idea to see. What does the Bible have to say? What does God have to say? What counts is there for me? As to the age of the earth, the Bible doesn't say diddly squat. It is an interpretation based on a calculation of genealogies, genealogies that seem to lead back to mythical figures. When a genealogy leads to someone that we know didn't exist, that genealogy ceases to be useful for determining timescales. In Job 38.4, God is questioning Job and he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. So God quoted Ken Ham with a fancy version of, were you there? Okay, yeah, I wasn't there, but I have more understanding about the formation of the earth than the Bible does. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. It's purely a product of the times. I live in a time where almost everybody has a better understanding of where the earth came from than those who lived when the Bible was written. What I'm proposing is this, and many have found it effective. The next time somebody in your hearing says something and something millions of years, you, with courtesy, 
raise your hand, ask to speak, and say, excuse me, were you there? Uh, did you set a clock? Did you uh, register this amount of time? No, but the rocks were there, and they set a clock. You see, a lot of people just keep repeating millions of years without even realizing where it comes from. It comes from science. Many sciences, actually. Geochronology, cosmology, astronomy. Dendrochronology doesn't quite get us back to millions of years, but it certainly gets us farther back than you think the universe existed. And then the study of ice cores, which gets us back to about 2.7 million years. And there's more. They just assume that it's right, but not knowing that it's actually wrong. So the scientists who constantly test different radiometric dating methods on different materials formed in different environments to see if they can suss out any problems with the method are just blindly assuming that their methods are correct? The scientists that you referenced in this very talk, the ones writing papers about excess radiogenic argon being found and needing to be accounted for, the ones writing papers about the reservoir effect and the deficiency of carbon-14 in animals that were expected to have higher levels, and pointing out that these situations need to be accounted for, these guys are just assuming that it's correct? Never mind the rest of the paper that comes after the first half of the first sentence of the abstract. That one sentence fragment is all that we need to prove that these scientists are just assuming that their dating methods are correct. Give me a break. So let's give a little practice. I'll count to three. And even though you're watching through video, uh, you say it too, will you? Just to get in the habit of it. Were you there? Ready? One, two, three. Were you there? Of course they are brainwashing us. Now some people say, oh John, I could never do that. Why not? Well, what if they regret turn the question on me? Well, were you there? What should I tell them? Well, tell them that you weren't there. I tell them I wasn't there. I said, but a good friend of mine was there and he's left me a record of everything that he saw, that happened, that he did, and to date he hasn't failed in anything. Can you introduce me to this friend? No? Your friend can't be seen or heard in a way that is independently verifiable? How convenient. Really? Who's your friend? My Heavenly Father. And what's the record? The Bible. Because the book that tells you how much you can beat your slaves is the best book to go to to figure out the age of the earth. That's basically it. He just goes through more things that in nature can take a while to form, but people have successfully done it in a lab fairly quickly. So this is the end for Johnny Boy. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Aldiha, who says, I just want to point out that his quote about let no man separate was in answer to a very direct and specific question about divorce. Does he ever state that divorce should be illegal? I doubt it. This was on the first part of my recent video responding to a guy complaining that same-sex marriage has been affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court. And yeah, I never really thought to look up the context of that verse for whatever reason, but it is a direct response to Jesus being asked by a Pharisee if it is lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause. So again, if we want to put biblical rules into law, that means that it should be illegal to divorce for anything other than adultery. But you'll never find a religious group lobbying for this, possibly because of the higher divorce rate among evangelicals than among the general population. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my PayPal donors, Nico and Stuart, and my patrons, David Schinkel, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are <laughs> brainwashing us. If you'd like to brainwash us, you can support the channel for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Other ways to support the channel, such as direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, are linked in the description, as well as my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!